Hello, and welcome back to Best Seller TV. I am your co-host, Cynthia Johnson, and I'm here with the lovely Rhett Power. Hi, Rhett. How well, are you? Well, thank you. Those were very kind words. It's good to be with you again. Yes, and it's great to be here with our author of the week, uh, Gabriella Rosen Kellerman. She's an author, entrepreneur, startup executive, and Harvard-trained physician. Her expertise is in behavioral and organizational change, digital health, well-being, and AI. Her first book, Tomorrow Mind, co-authored with Professor Martin Seligman. Uh, she has served as the Chief Product Officer at BetterUp and is currently the Chief Innovation Officer at BetterUp and Head of BetterUp Labs. Welcome, Gabriella. It's so great to have you. Oh, thanks so much. It's great to be with you both. Very good to have you. Uh, I, I can't wait to, to talk about this topic because it is so timely and so relevant to what you know our our leaders and our and our founders and our organizations are dealing with, uh, even even big organizations, right? And and so um, because I think in the last few years leadership has drastically uh, evolved and changed, and and so tell us a bit about your background and and then what. Because you're 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 coming at this from a medical perspective uh, as an MD and in, in psychiatry, but what inspired in that background for you to start writing and to to really write this book? Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, I did start my career in medicine, and um, I've always wanted to work on this challenge of helping populations thrive. Um, it bothered me at a young age, and it still bothers me that we accept a certain amount of emotional suffering in our life as a status quo and as normal, um, and that we've made lifespan longer, we've raised the standard of living, but we haven't changed the uh, experience of life in terms of the level of suffering it, it entails. And so that's a, a huge problem. Um, there's no one place to work on it. And as a teenager, I figured I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, scientifically minded, I figured I'll get all the scientific tools to think about the brain and to think about why we suffer and understand that. And at some point, I started getting interested in the public health perspective. So I worked at the World Health Organization. It turns out that clinical psychiatry is not a great place today to work on population level well being. It's much more about helping individuals who are struggling with pretty, in some cases, pretty severe psychopathology. Um, and that's where a lot of our funding goes in terms of drug discovery, extremely important population, still in many ways a highly underserved population. But at the same time, if, if my sort of calling and passion area was thriving for everyone, that wasn't going to be the right place to focus. So it was 15 years ago that I left medicine for tech. Why tech? Because it was a place where a lot of innovation was happening around tools related to well-being. Um, and in so doing, found partnerships throughout uh, with large enterprises who were investing in this new technology to help people grow and thrive. And so that's really been my home and understanding the world and the challenges of uh, professionals who are trying to live their best life, both personally and professionally, um, and how to build tools and support to, to help them do that is, has been the project of those 15 years. Um, as you guys know, this is not the, the world of work we evolved in, the world of hunter-gatherers, right? It couldn't be right. more different. It's this sort of technological hurricane and we wake up every day and there's something brand new and it, it's hard and it's startling and you know it may be internal to our organization or our team or it may be external, but it has these ripple effects. Um, so understanding that environment has become a really important part of my work um, of my life's work, of my current work as Chief Innovation Officer at BetterUp, um, and doing that through a scientific lens, doing that in a data-driven way. And we've come across all of these insights now over the, the years of research, in particular in partnership with Marty Seligman at UPenn. And we wanted to capture the big picture of that research, even as we publish pieces of it in, in academic journals and um, in popular magazines and outlets, the bigger picture of what is this that's happening around us? Why is it hitting us in a certain way? And what are the gaps between kind of our native capabilities and the skills that we need to do well? 
um, calling all that out and, and hopefully teaching people how to build those. So with all of the you know, years of, I'm sorry, Red, to jump in, but I'm so curious with, you say, you're saying you know, 15 years ago, you went into the space and then there was all, there's all this research. Um, at what point did you know it was time to write the book? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it's interesting because there was one particular area of the research on prospection, which is how we think about the future. That uh, is one of the areas we've spent a lot of time and a lot of money through Better Up Labs studying. And we originally said, we're going to write a book about that because we felt like we have a, a big picture perspective on that. Um, and, uh, and, and the idea was like, it was a, the quantity of research. It was some nuanced findings. So also this idea that prospection is, um, it's not a familiar concept. Even the word probably isn't ringing a bell with many people watching this now. It's really about future mindedness and foresight, but it happens to be essential for our, our world of work today. So we thought a book would be the right way to help people with that. And then as we step back to try to explain why is this important, we realized we couldn't just talk about prospection alone. There were these four other skills we needed to talk about as well. And so it went from one skill prospection to five skills, the, the PRISM acronym, um, and became this bigger book. But it, it started from a desire to tell the story of prospection in particular. No, that's fascinating. What is What does tomorrow mind mean? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a way of thinking about the skills we need to thrive at work today. Um, and it is uh, it, that that title was originally inspired by prospection, which again is about future mindedness. Okay. Um, and so there, there's a little bit of a play on words here, because on the one hand, it's about how do we think about the future in a healthy um, and effective way? It's also, though, positioning this work within the conversation of the future of work, um, which, you know, is inherently about tomorrow. And, uh, and so there's both of those dimensions implied by that word. What, what are the skills that we need today to, to be successful? Yeah. So yeah. there's, there's five. They're summarized by the acronym PRISM. Um, the book goes through each of them. I'll tell you what PRISM stands for, but I'll just first say that the book doesn't go in order of the acronym because the way the skills build doesn't actually align to that order. So the acronym's out of order, but it, it's a great word. So that's what we're sticking with. Um, so the P is prospection, which again is our ability to imagine and plan for the future. And in an era where change is coming at us fast and furious all the time, every bit of edge we can get on not necessarily predicting, but being prepared for a really wide range of changes, positions us to be successful and to make the most of those changes really as opportunities. So that's prospection. R is resilience. That's the first skill we cover in the book because it's so foundational. Resilience is our ability to get back up after a challenge. Um, at its most extreme, it's anti-fragility, which is our ability to grow stronger because of challenge. And so if you imagine we, you know, we wake up in this, in this technological hurricane, every storm that comes our way, we're growing stronger because of it. That's a very different point of departure than being someone who's just like barely able to get out of bed storm after storm. So correcting that, getting people into a more centered, ready place is, is the goal of the resilience work. The eyes for innovation, um, innovation and creativity is a, an essential work skill today. Um, we see this more and more in, in all the future of work reports, but also in our data around what people are asking for help with. They're being asked to innovate more frequently on a, a larger number and a wider array of problems because all of this novelty means we're you know, at all levels of the organization trying to solve for things we've never seen before. Um, with increasing frequency. So the science of what that means and how to do it and how to build teams that can do it is, is what that's about. The S is for social support. And in particular, social connection is really the skill to establish the social support. In particular, we develop this concept of rapid rapport, which is how do we quickly build trust across difference? We know that we need trust to get to great outcomes for our own well-being, 
to get to great outcomes for our organization in terms of collaboration and innovation. And also for our customers, we can't delight our customers, we can't do well by our customers if we don't have a, a connection, a true connection with them. And as we automate more and more of customer service, the expectations of what a human connection with a company uh, is delivering are higher and we need to get better at connecting with people quickly. And then the last one is mattering, M for mattering, which is this very basic level of a feeling that our efforts, there's some point to our efforts. Now, you can go all the way to meaning and purpose, which is really where we came at mattering from. We started with meaning and purpose, and there's a lot of reasons we could talk about why we landed on mattering. But mattering is sort of the, the lowest, the minimum bar for helping people feel that their efforts matter. And if we don't feel it matters, we're not going to go back to work, period, right? We're not going to just run in a hamster wheel for no reason. So a big part of the motivation to show up to work, the motivation to work on all of this on the one hand, and then also for leaders, the skills required is helping people feel that that work matters. Even, by the way, when you're asking them to stop doing something that they've been working on for a year and do something completely different, you need to be able to narrate for them why did that year matter, even though we're, we're walking away from it, and why should you believe me that this next year is going to matter too? Yeah, that's uh, that's really powerful, right? The the idea that I mean, that's mattering is the lowest form of that. Yeah, I saw. I was walking by a house. I, I live in Berkeley, as I mentioned. You guys, I was walking by a house that had a a Black Lives Matter sign up and then next to it was a sign that said mattering is the minimum and I thought that was really important you know all, all of these movements to emphasize mattering like let's not forget that that's really the bare minimum it's something we can all agree on so that's why I think we're, we're hanging our hats on it but it's not the be all and the end all it's it's where we need to start do we uh, it seems to me I mean these this is this book and and correct me if I'm wrong this is a really essential book for leadership today. And I think I want to know, are these skills, are they all intuitive? Are they, can they be taught? Can we as leaders learn to be more resilient? Can we learn, um, you know, I, I just, these are, these are, some of these are hard really. Yeah. And if Thanks. these aren't not, these aren't natural to, to, to most. Yeah, thanks for asking this. So a few a few points. Um, first is everything we talk about in the book can be learned. So we're not in the business of adi uh, diagnose adios, <laughs> right? We we want to help people, and um, that's the first thing. All of them, and we have tons of data to show it, and we're trying to help people build them. The second thing is it is true that some people by virtue of nature or nurture or some combination have an easier time with some of these and a harder time with others. And to us, that just means we need to take a personalized approach. It's not a one size fits all. So as one example of resilience, there's five drivers of resilience and each of us is going to be better at some and worse at others. And we focus on the ones where we have more room to grow. And we also lean into our strengths and, you know, in, in times of, of challenge. So having that self-awareness of our own natural or nurtural predispositions is useful, but we want to help people grow um, regardless. And then I think the last point I just want to emphasize from your, your question is like leadership, it's, um, it's not today what it, it used to be. And, and leadership changes depending on the nature of work and, Part of what uh, I see all the time in working with large organizations and individual leaders is lots of people who are put in leadership roles thinking it's one thing when actually it's another. And in many cases, it's not anyone's fault that that happened, but we do need to take a step back and be really clear headed about what leadership in this, what we call the whitewater world of work means and looks like. Um, people leadership specifically, managing people is very different today. And it requires, you know, it, it gives you energy in different ways and it drains your energy in different ways. And the more we can be clear and transparent about that, the more we can set people up for success. Part of that also means people for whom that's not a fit 
need a different way to progress their career. Otherwise, it's going to be a, you know, a round peg square hole problem where we're trying to people are trying to fit themselves into something that's not good. And the people who report to them are going to suffer because that's the only way they think they can progress. And, that, you know, it's not how it has to be. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because uh, you do you think, oh, I'll be a leader, and that'll be easy, <laughs> or that's the the tone that some people you know, and it's actually maybe the hardest thing ever for for someone who isn't who likes to get in the work, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then and recognizing that as a as a personality trait, and they're both. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're describing like future leadership almost anyone could be a leader without a title. Is that, is it, that's the kind of the tomorrow mind, right? I think that's really true. Yeah. You can be a leader without a title and I'll say you can have the title and not be doing justice to those, those skills. Um, right. I mean, I think what you're, what you're saying, part of what you're saying that Cynthia is there's this level modern leadership, there's a level of emotional labor that's required um, because this is hard. It's, it's hard for humans to do what we're doing. And when people are stuck and they're having a tough time, it is natural and also probably correct to look for some amount of support and guidance and coaching ultimately from your manager. So that person has to be someone who's going to be in, inspired by that and energized by that. And if they're not, it's really going to be a drag. Yeah. You know, I, Go ahead. I, this is not a fair question, probably, and I, <laughs> I apologize in advance. <laughs> but you know, just from your background, and you know, I'm an executive coach, and I, I, I work with entrepreneurs and and founders, and you know, I, I the, God, this is just not a fair question. I apologize. But do you think it's just from your experience that it's healthy? for leaders in this new world that we're in and in in everything that we're having to to learn how to do and and cope with and the stress of that to sort of proactively talk to somebody hmm. you know i mean i, I could, because it, to me it's it's a um you know i, I was I, i'll use this example so my 17 year old came home they finished school a couple of weeks ago and he he said you know we've been talking about cancel called getting canceled and the things that'll get us canceled. And, and he's like, this is what we're talking about with our friends. And a 17 year old's worried about getting canceled. And so if a 17 year old is worried about how society is going to treat him, like for CEOs, it is, a, it is very top of mind that if they say something wrong, do something wrong, yeah. take a wrong, you know? So, yeah. so what do you think? Like, it's just, I, and I, you know, I just, yeah. I'm just kind of, but because there's a lot of stress in that. Totally. Um, yeah. And I'm, I think there's two levels of your question that I'm playing around with in my head as I'm thinking about how to answer it. One is like, it's just a very volatile world and we need support and talking to people in one form or another, whether it's a mentor or a coach or a therapist um, can be so helpful to us. And then the other is specifically around cancel culture where, Sometimes you need a safe place to try out words and try out language to make sure that you're not going to get canceled more broadly for saying something. So, yeah, I'd say both of those for both of those things, I think it, it's extremely important. And part of why I'm so passionate about the rise of coaching and, you know, what what you do, Red and Cynthia, I know you do some of it, too. And, I, you know, I, of course, do it is for so long. Therapy was the only way to talk to someone and. First of all, we have a shortage of therapists. Second of all, they're really trained. And, you know, I myself originally was trained to help people who are struggling with a clinical condition. Um, and third of all, like that a lot of what we need to talk about, it doesn't fall in the DSM. So this idea of coaching and people who are specialized in helping people talk through their challenges is, is so powerful. And all of these skills, these prism skills, we have so much data on how coaching in particular is an incredibly powerful way 
to grow those skills. Now, not everyone today yet can afford a coach. I do see that changing in the next 10 years. I think that we will get there with, with humans, not just with AI, but AI maybe can offload parts of the human conversation that don't need to be done by the human and save the coach again for these really high impact moments of epiphany and nuanced conversation. Um, very long-winded answer to your question, but no, I think I, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, I think we're, I'm, I'm, I'm continue to be fascinated by the mystery of why is it so powerful to just be able to talk to somebody? Um, but so much goodness happens when we are able to ask powerful questions and listen in the right way and help people on their journey of, of self-discovery. Amen. <laughs> it's so interesting how different we all, we all are, and especially in a workplace uh, environment. And I think I, someone who started, I worked in, a, in an ideal environment for myself, which gave me leadership space, but not all of the responsibility. And then that company was acquired, and I worked inside of a, of a corporation, and I remember being like, Let's just blow it up from the inside out. Like this thing's a mess in here, <laughs> right? Um, and wasn't wasn't a fit. And then I started my own company, and I quickly learned the lessons of what it's like to have all of the responsibility, and, and and grow and grow through that. And just over these different parts of my experience, I have, people are so different. I can look at someone now and go, wow, you are not a fit for your job, but I know exactly where you'd be perfect now that, cause I've seen it. I've seen you in these roles before. Um, and now we're in this place where mostly virtual and we're relying on coaches pretty heavily to help guide our teams and our employees to solutions on their own. Um, what role does the, I mean, and I'm going to, I'm asking this because of better up too, right? It's like, what role does the, your company have in in both facilitating the coaching experience mm -hmm. and offering, but also giving space to to hear the outcome and and actually implement whatever that is. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think that there's a lot of ways to um, to sort of scale this approach. Of course, better up's a great great way to scale coaching to lots of levels. Um, I do think that there is a lot of work to be done back to our original point about what does leadership today look like and mean around training leaders to be coaches. Um, there are certain core coaching skills that can be taught to, you know, anyone who's going to qualify for modern leadership can be taught some of these core coaching skills and that can unlock a lot. For the, the organization. The other part of your question, though, I think is around what's the role of the individual versus kind of the system around them. Um, and I think that's a very important question. And there's there's sort of two layers to my answer. So one is that um, we can ultimately we can only control what we ourselves do as individuals. If we're leaders, we can help control the system. If we're not, you know, we can't. Um, but a huge part of psychological well-being is the ability to take ownership of what we can control and be okay with the parts that we can't. So working one-on-one -on -one with an individual, looking at how am I going to help someone successfully get through this chapter, that's a big part of the work. And by contrast, when we don't have that concept in place, um, particularly when we uh, you know, feel like the things around us, it's just too much, and we're kind of a, a victim of the environment, it leads to negative psychological outcomes for people, right? It leads to depression, um, PTSD, anxiety, substance, all kinds of things that we want to help people avoid. So from an individual empowerment, I think there's an important way of saying, what can I as an individual do and, and focus on that? At the same time, it is absolutely true that there are systemic factors that make it really hard for people to thrive in certain environments and organizations need a lot of help seeing that and understanding that and changing that. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot of data to help them go on that journey now. I think that uh, it's a little harder to do that when we're in an economic recession. Um, it's a little easier to do that in a strong labor market 
But regardless, if you're looking to get the most out of your employees, which every company is, then these are things that you need to understand and what are the best practices to help people really fulfill their potential? What can you do at the systemic level? So I think it's a both and. Um, the watch out, and this is a point that my co-author Marty Seligman makes often, is that if we teach people that we need to change the system and that's gonna be the fix and sort of like just wait for that, it leads to patterns of learned helplessness, which again is just really bad for our well being, our performance, our life satisfaction. So it's important to be able to kind of hold both of those things. I, I'm again asking you to to a bunch of unfair questions today, but if you <laughs> if you had to give most companies a grade, mm -hmm. uh, on how we do on, on these uh, really important uh, ways that we take care of people and we take care of ourselves. How, do, how are we doing kind of across the board? I know it's a very general question, but what do you think? Yeah. And did the pandemic shift that at all? Did it, did okay. it make it at that? So the pandemic helped uh, companies care more. Um, it really did. Um, it, you know, it swung the pendulum in favor of a lot of conversations around well-being, uh, conversations around work-life balance. Um, I will say it's been troubling to see how quickly the pendulum has swung back in the opposite direction. And one of my answers to how I would grade any individual company is like, how measured are those pendulum swings in any moment? And I think the ones who are so, so, in the recession, it's become all about performance, you know, it's the year of efficiency or whatever. Uh, it was that that um, Zuckerberg has said and others have said, and um, it's understandable, but the lesson, my hope that the lesson of the pandemic would have partially been that well-being drives performance. And so if you turn well-being into something that's a nice to have, then, you know, you do that to the detriment of your own share price, by the way, which um, Jean-Emmanuel Deneuve recently showed in a great paper looking at stock price based on employee well-being. Um, mm -hmm. And that in, you know, you do it at the expense of the sustainability of your entire organization. So I think we are still very uh, immature in our understanding of this. There's still a huge amount of legacy and shadow of the industrial revolution that led to the ways we think about people as machines. Um, and that's not how we work and it's not who we are. So I, I think I'm gonna refrain from giving a grade. I will say there are some A companies out there and that's great to see. Um, and there, there are others at the opposite end. Um, sure. Hopefully as more and more leaders come up from a generation that's a little uh, more attuned to these things. Um, hopefully we will see more of that change. And as folks get more curious about the science that's out there, you know, I, I think reading papers, reading studies, like look at the data. It doesn't have to be a, a matter of I believe this or I don't. Just look at the studies. It's safe to say we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm not trying to put more work on you, but <laughs> you on the podcast for you, but I don't know, pull a study and talk about it for us. Like, that, would, that would be great. I would. <laughs> yeah, there are honestly, there's so much great work out there, um, and we need more avenues for dissemination, and we need to help people also with just general literacy around behavioral science. It's one of the points to make at the end of the book that. Um, it's very hard to make a business case around some of this because of the length of time to see these changes play out, A, eh? of the sophistication of some of the statistical methods that are used. It's not just like bring in this vendor and they'll replace our in-house person and, you know, we get the same outcome for less money. It's, it's not an efficiency sale. It's an effectiveness sale. And that's much more nuanced and it would help if we all had more education and, you know, probably in secondary school around these concepts and these studies and, and this just mindset of how to think about outcomes that are more complex. Yeah. We have gotten to the end of our time, unfortunately. So let's uh, ask one final question is where can we get the book? Yeah, you can get it on any major retailer online um, or in, in person. 
Um, it's published by Atrio, which is Simon and Schuster. So there's a page for the book that has lots of links there. Or my website has all the same links, and that's just Gabriella Rosenkellerman.com or Gabriella Kellerman.com. Um, and if you would like to follow me on Instagram, I would love that too, at Gabriella Rosenkellerman. And Gabriella, let me ask you just real quick. Do you go into companies and give a talk I about do, this? I do, and I love, I love to do it. So I love to talk about the broader concepts. I love to talk about resilience, creativity, the relationship okay. of all these things to performance, the science of it, all of the above. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Fred. So they, can find out, they can find out how to do that, too, if they, mm -hmm. if they want to into this. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Rhett. Thank you guys so much for the conversation and thanks for hosting this great podcast. Yes, absolutely. And, and for everyone watching at home, we are Bestseller TV. We'll be back next week with another amazing author. Thank you, Gabriella, for being here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.